Welcome back to Conversations with Jackie and Bobby Angel. We're your host, Jackie and Bobby. Hey. And with us today is a friend, uh, Dr. Gregory Bataro, who is a clinical psychologist. He's the founder of Catholic Psych Institute. He was a Franciscan friar for about four years and has his seventh child on the way this December. Dr. Greg, great to see you again. Thanks so much. It's great to be here with you guys. I forget how many interviews we've already done with, I was, I was searching online. I'm like, oh, we've already like talked online. There's recordings of conversations, you for us and us for you. And it's it's funny. I I was telling Barbara about this in the schedule for the afternoon, trying to organize kids and figure out who's going to go where. And she's like, they're, they're starting a podcast. I thought they already had a podcast. (laughs) She's like, didn't you and I do an interview with them for their podcast like three years ago? (laughs) <laughs> Wait, was that for us? I thought it was for them. It was like an informal, it was like COVID and everyone was kind of experimenting with their own shows and we didn't really go anywhere, but we had fun. We had a fun conversation. What, I couldn't remember if it was for like one of the other, one of the other organizations or somewhere else where it, like, I don't know who it was doing, but yeah, we've talked many times here. <laughs> and then during COVID, I was watching Property Brothers randomly in season, was it season 10? And all of a sudden your face appears. I'm like, wait, they were on Property Brothers? Yes. Wait, so you guys were on Property Brothers. What, was it season 10 or 11? Season, oh gosh, I, th- I thought it was season five, but they, really? they might have changed up the Oh, yeah, how they number. Because the, the, the stuff gets replayed so many times. It's been, I think, and I, 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 I like literally three, ran in the- now. Yeah, I ran in the other room like, Bobby, come here. Like, look who's on Property Brothers. <laughs> I said, no, it's not him. She's like, no, it's him. I know. He didn't, he didn't believe me. Um, but yeah, so I was like, that was, which I love watching that show. But anyways, we're not here to talk about Property Brothers, although that could be another episode for like, could be a, a whole the inside episode. scoop of what it's like to be on a reality TV show. Yeah, that's but, fun. We're on borrowed time because your kids are napping, our kids are napping, and we're going to have an all too brief conversation on psychology, on psych- how we're the... the psychology and human anthropology meet in the Catholic view of the human person. Uh, But Dr. Greg, do you mind sharing a little bit more of your story of faith? I shared a a quick overview of your bio at the start, but were you always Catholic? Is it conversion? Was there a reversion? What's your story? I was raised nominally Catholic in a Catholic family. Um, Family was more important than being Catholic. And then my parents got divorced when I was 17. So it really shattered my foundation in my world when like the thing that we were raised on is the most important thing was then ripped out from underneath. And so when I was right as I was going into college, I kind of had this crisis trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted to do. And that's when I was by God's grace going into Boston College. I had freshman classes with Peter Kreeft and uh, sat down with like three, you know, I ended up taking three different philosophy courses with him in a year. And he just blew my mind wide open to the truth and beauty of and of of the the catholic philosophy and just the way that the way to think really just to reason and to think clearly and then he introduced me to john paul ii and i was reading love and responsibility and really went very deep into wanting to give my life over to this truth and this goodness and this beauty and i also read a biography of saint francis and i found that to be a really awesome way to really give oneself to god and this total devotion and dedication. So those were the seeds that eventually became my life. Now, 22 years later, that was the year 2000. It was the Jubilee year. And uh, that's when I met John Paul II's writings and fell in love with the church, fell in love with St. Francis. And that ultimately got me on a path to understanding psychology through this integrated lens. When I read Love and Responsibility, it's all about, obviously, love and relationships and how to actually navigate marriage correctly. And that was such healing medicine to my soul after my parents' divorce. And I was, I was so convinced that this is the way to heal marriages. And if, if we're going to be doing marriage therapy or any kind of therapy, we have to start from this kind of foundation. And so uh, this has been a 22 year journey to find a way to encapsulate this Catholic truth in a way that can be applied to mental health. And that's what got us really to where I am today, where we're launching our certification. And it really comes down to that same seed that was planted 22 years ago. Yeah, I want to come back to the the certification and how you're, you're taking John Paul II's vision of the human person and applying it in a programmatic way. I feel like we meet at these different milestones where like, 
we're having a different kid or you're writing a new book. And we, I think we have all three of your books, The Consecration to St. Joseph, The Mindful Catholic, and then Sitting Like a Saint. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll see Jackie reading that book to the kids and the kids are all sprawled out on the floor. <laughs> it's like, very cute. It is very cute. So I highly, I highly recommend that book. Um, and so how beautiful, because obviously we have a love too for St. John Paul II and how he has shown us how to love rightly, how to integrate all the different parts of the human person, uh, which includes psychology, which includes mental health, and how beautiful that your own story of faith, your own devotion and trajectory has, it's not like I have to bracket psychology away from my my faith, um, right. or there, there's two boxes that don't touch. It's like, no, no, it's, it's to be fully human, it means integrating all these dynamics. Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, I think it's because my my journey into the faith started with reason through the, the philosophy with Peter Kreeft that like we can't bracket how we think out of the faith and the philosophy and the way that we sort of understand truth. So it's in some sense, it's a benefit of not growing up with a lot of the faith kind of spoon fed to me because then it becomes more about ritual and practice and tradition and all those things are super important, but I don't have that as a foundation to rely on. I had to kind of go build that afterwards. But the thing that I could rely on now as a foundation is that, of course, what makes sense and is true and good and beautiful has to be integrated with the faith from step one. And nothing else would ever make sense. It's not worth giving my life to this if it doesn't make sense that way. And so that has provided this orientation for the, the whole development of the Catholic Psych Institute and everything else that we're doing. Now, I so I I love psychology, and I minored in psych and sociology in school. And I want to ask you, when you were going through school and studying psychology, were there, I mean, did you have to kind of weed through things and, and discern, like, is this in line with the Catholic idea of, of human and person? Like, did you have to do that as you were getting your, you know, becoming a doctor in psychology? Yeah, a little bit, not as much, because I went to a really Catholic program. And they're doing a great job to kind of start the ball rolling in this conversation. And and so, you know, I've I've mentored other students in other programs now, and I've seen the horror that they've had to deal with. And honestly, I've had to mentor them at a, in, a, in a way that's more like spiritual direction, helping them to preserve their soul. Because these programs are directing them to do things that would lead one into sin and experiences that they have to have and cultural diversity type things that they have to venture out into. I mean, you can only imagine what a state program in New York City is requiring of their students to quote unquote understand, uh, you know, marginalized populations. So, you know, these students are coming to me like, what do I do? I can't go to these places and do, and it's like, all right, we got to figure this out. So I didn't have to deal with any of that stuff because I was at a Catholic program, but the thing that's missing is a, a deeply embedded integration of what's Catholic from the from the first step of studying the psychology. You know, so it's it's interesting because a lot of this stuff you would recognize from either undergraduate psychology or pop psychology right now. Like everybody talks about attachment theory. A lot of people talk about positive psychology. A lot of people are talking about what's called internal family systems. And there's a lot of this stuff that's floating around and it's it's sort of absorbed by Catholic schools, Catholic ideas, Catholic pages, whatever. But nobody's really looking at that going like, well, but how Catholic is that? You know, it's 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 great that we found something in the secular world that kind of mirrors or speaks to or echoes things we know about truth from a Catholic perspective. But for instance, positive psychology, everybody loves positive psychology. It's started by Martin Seligman, who doesn't believe in God. So he writes a book on character development, character virtue. And, and people are like, virtue, oh, they're talking about virtue in, psycho in, in secular psychology. And so they're like, all right, so, so oh, this is great for us as Catholic therapists, so we should be able to use this. It's like, well, wait, 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 let's back up a second. Like, what does he mean by virtue? He keeps using that word. I do not think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> you know, so we have to be able to discern, even if like step one is like, okay, I don't have to go to like the weird debaucherous clubs. Okay, that's great. But 
deeper than that, like I also have to be able to fine tooth comb precisely discern what is actually Catholic as we are learning the psychology from the secular world. So I would say on that level, I did have to still do some of that filtering. Well, and if any students are Catholic and they're studying psychology, but they maybe aren't very into their faith, like they don't know their faith very well, they just kind of receive it without any discerning lens and think that that is what is true, which actually I had to look back at what I learned in college in my sociology classes, in my psychology classes, and re-ask myself, like, wait a second, I believe this was true because a professor told me it was true. Right. And I've been believing that for the last 15, actually, how, I don't know how long it's been, yeah, 15 years since college. And then now that I'm I'm in my Catholic faith, I'm like just starting like, wait, was that true? Or were they just telling me something that was their own bias or something that they believe is true that really isn't in line with my Catholic faith. It's it's really hard. And and when we're in those vulnerable positions of of being a student, it's such a sacred time. That's why John Paul II loves students so much. He just really referenced that vulnerability and he nurtured and cared for it with such delicacy. You know, like just like a nurturing mother. And and just wanted to like sort of coddle and cradle that that vulnerability and and bring people to a place of 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 enjoying with like deep enjoyment that 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 goodness that comes from learning and being transformed in that truth and and it's just taken for granted and and people use the words without thinking and they drive agendas without thinking and and they're just creating disaster it's it's a really dangerous and and really difficult situation that we find ourselves in it's tough too if you find yourself wanting to help people, and so you're going to medical school, you're going to uh, learn psychotherapy, and you're being confronted with all these worldviews and these teachings that are antagonistic to the faith or antithetical. And I can I can imagine the well, I got to play the game. Like if I want to get licensed, if I want to actually right. help people, I've got to just kind of stay quiet, um, nod my head write the right answer for the test to get through yeah to get credentialed yeah and that's that's definitely where i started that you know you you sort of figure that out when you're a student you kind of just have to do you know do your duty and then you know god has called me to go further past that and you know everybody has different gifts and and uh, you know some of the gifts that god has has given me and some of the amazing gifts that god has given me through the people that he's put in my life the mentors he's given me that have taught me so much about other kinds of other pursuits outside of therapy or psychology itself, like entrepreneurialism and, you know, sort of stepping outside of the box and thinking differently. And even in some ways that he's used, you know, the, the, the wound of my parents divorce and having to kind of quote unquote, figure it out on my own. It's, it's a beautiful redemption of that wound that now, like, because of that, now I can look at the way that the field has failed me and I can now figure it out on my own. And I've had to step outside and find courage somewhere to say like, well, if we, if we are a trailblazer now, instead of just jumping through hoops, is there something that we can do that's even better? And so that's why we were creating the certification so that other people have an op- opportunity to do something where they don't have to actually jump through those same hoops anymore. And now there's a possibility to do something that's thoroughly, deeply Catholic from day one. And is the certification for both people who want to be psychologists or therapists and people who just want to get the certification like me, I don't necessarily want to have to get a master's and become licensed, but I just do ministry and I love doing ministry and I just love helping people. So are are there two separate tracks for those types of people? Yeah, exactly. There are two tracks. And and so so the more that we've talked about this, that I talk about this, that I get involved with other people, like in different ministries, learning about what you guys do, learning about even within the world of education. And it, it's people are hungry for this truth. You know, priests uh, that are fed up with poor human formation in the seminary systems or you know from the from the top down sort of hierarchical church not providing real direction to people and what to do in the midst of whether we're talking about covid or post scandal church or 
whatever. It's like, or mental health crisis now in the world that everybody's like crying out for help for. People are hungry for this kind of truth and understanding of our actual human experience. So we've, as, as I was originally sort of envisioning this to be for professionals, it just became very clear that, in fact, I think maybe you were one of the first people that asked me that same question like a year ago. Like, well, maybe we should probably make this also available for like stay at home moms that want to do, you know, be a better mom or for homeschooling or teachers who are using this in their school system or, um, you know, priests in ministry or missionaries who are going out and doing great work. So, so yeah, we do have two tracks. There's, there's a, what I'm calling the first responders track. It's mental health first responders, basically anybody who's in any kind of work where you have to bear the mental health crosses of others in your, in your life. And so you literally, it could just be a, a, a mom and dad or, or any of those other kinds of ministries that I mentioned. And then, and then the second level the sort of higher level is the professional mentor track. And that's going to be the more professional avenue for people that want to actually turn this into a business. And we, we teach people how to actually like develop a business plan and do this outside of the normal box that most people think about with mental health. And would that be on top of like, once they get licensed, then they would go through a certification and kind of do that? Is that like after that point? That's a good question. It's either. So, okay. you know, so the, the sort of more common and sort of safer path where, where people are starting to think about this is like, all right, I'm already doing licensed psychotherapy. And actually it could be scary in their own right on that in that way as well, because it's like, can I do this also on the side? Or how can I use this and integrate it into what I'm doing? So there's a lot of different use cases here. But basically, we differentiate the, our model from our modality. And what that means is we've developed a model, which is an understanding of the human person, how people are made, how people are wounded, and how we can help people through accompaniment. That's our model. That model can be applied to many modalities. So when I was only doing psychotherapy, that was the model that we used. It's the model that we're now teaching. It's the model that I trained our internal Catholic psych therapist on. But then we kind of hit a wall where because of the model, we realized the modality of psychotherapy is, is kind of limited. And, and what I mean by that is if we want to actually walk with people like Christ did and does, like how can I help people the way that Christ would? He met the woman at the well. He walked with the, the, the men on the road to Emmaus. And, and he met people where they were, and he, he entered into their life. And then I was like sitting in my office one day reflecting on this, waiting for a, a client to show up for an appointment. You know, I'm looking down at my watch. Have they got here yet to my office? You know, and then I found out actually they came in quietly. They were waiting outside in my waiting room. And I hadn't heard them come in, so I didn't go get them to bring them into my office out of my waiting room. And this client was particularly disheveled because he was, you know, late and then he was in traffic and then he had missed something. Da, da, da. And I was just like, what am I doing? Like, I'm making this person come into my life instead of me actually going out into their life. And so there's a lot to work out from there. But but basically, the, the modality of psychotherapy for me hit a wall. And so we developed a new modality that we call now mentorship. So the question is, what can people do with our model? Well, you can do psychotherapy with the model. In my opinion, it's kind of limited as a modality to do psychotherapy, but you can still do it just like you can do spiritual direction with this model. You can do ministry with this model. Uh, you can, you can, I mean, really honestly can do anything with the model because the model is about people. So you could paint somebody's house with this model in mind thinking about the beauty of what they're thinking of their house and how that brings them closer to God. Like that's a stretch. We're not really teaching people how to t paint houses, but it's the model is the core foundational point. The modality is how you're going to use it. So we started off with a psychotherapy mo modality. Then we branched out and now we are doing both. And actually we're moving towards closing down the psychotherapy practice and only going into the mentorship modality, because really we want to now focus on education and helping more people have access to the model that, that we've created. 
And can you tell people maybe there who are, don't understand, like what, what is that model exactly? Like that is different than psychotherapy. Could you kind of explain like, why would somebody get this certification versus doing something the, the else? The model or the modality? See, even I, <laughs> I've, I've confused you. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. But I can imagine like people are still like, wait, well, so what does that mean? And like, why would I, why would I do this instead of psychotherapy or why would I, so could you explain that? So like, mentorship, why should someone do it? Yeah. So mentorship as a modality is, is a, is a way of working with people. And so like, normally when you think like, okay, I need help and, and we're at a, we're at a, a phase, we're at a place in life where we're just, because we're developing something new, we're on the cusp of of this new development of a thing. So it makes sense. It's hard to wrap your mind around it. Like exactly what the heck are you talking about? You know, it's like iPods come out. It's like, you're going to put what, how many CDs are going to fit in my pocket? Like, no, I can't fit CDs in my pocket. Like, no, no, they're not CDs. They're songs. They're go on a drive. It's a, what, you know, so I have, cl- I have to click a wheel. I have to, and it moves around. Exactly. Clicking a wheel. I touch the screen. So where, but where does the CD go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the idea here is this, it's like you, you think like, okay, I have to I have to make a referral, get a referral, make an appointment, go to somebody for an appointment. And that appointment happens once a week. And that's the general accepted expectation of the modality of psychotherapy. Now, you're not even thinking about like, what does that person practice from as a model? But you know the modality. You don't know the model. But the modality is the thing that people get stuck on. It's like, well, this is what therapy is, right? Now, there is such a wide spectrum of models that are the foundation for individual therapist work. You know, so just take a very basic thing, like secularly, many marriage therapists don't have any bias towards protecting and saving or letting marriages dissolve. Right. And by by definition, they say that they shouldn't have a bias. Right. So so you should probably know that that's their model. Now, whether or not you talk to them once a week, once a month, whether they come to your house and live with you for a weekend, like those are different modalities of how they could probably help you. But the model is really important. It undergirds everything else. So what we decided is, number one, we have to define our model, what it is to be human and how to help people. And then because of what we believe about our humanity revealed to us by Christ and we need to follow Christ's footsteps, we want to really enter into other people's lives. So we have a new modality of mentorship in which we have daily accompaniment. We work with people on a daily basis. Instead of once a week, 45 minute in real time, you come to my office or onto my Zoom link that I give you. This is an ongoing dialogue that's going to be carried out on a daily basis. And we use technology to kind of create a hybrid of something that's more personal on one hand and been very quickly, very deeply intimate because you're engaging in an ongoing dialogue. You're literally always in the modality of mentorship. Hmm. And because I can send you a message every day, you could be sending me a message every day. Like you're always in this process of dialogue, which develops intimacy very quickly. It's like, you're really with your mentor. And your mentor is really with you. And but we're separating it out because they're they're recorded messages. So we're it's not like we're on call 24-7 to to pick up the phone and talk to our mentees anytime they feel like talking to us. But then within we have an, a, an expectation we set that within 24 hours we're gonna respond to whatever you tell us. So you can literally leave me a message at three o'clock in the morning and tell me why you're not sleeping or tell me what's bothering you. And you can reach out and I'm going to listen to those words with that sentiment. And I'm going to really enter into your life as you're sharing it with me from that place of that darkness or that frustration or whatever it is and enter in. And then the next morning or the next day that I'm going to, you know, I'm thinking and praying and reflecting and I'm giving you back some kind of response. And that's going to happen back and forth six or seven times in the space that you would have been waiting for your next appointment. And because of the space that opens up in between daily messages, you actually have more time for reflection before you're giving a response. So it's a kind of a a bit of an ironic thing that happens by by creating by creating space in between responses. You have more than instead of less when you're in that real time firing back and forth. Forty five minutes. Tell me what you're thinking. I'll respond. 
And now it's like, this is your only time to come up with everything that you wanted to say. Make sure you remembered everything you said all week to yourself that you wanted to bring up in therapy. And now you have to get it out and I'm going to respond to it. And that's all you get. End of session, walk out the door. Now you get to wait another six days. So that's the old psychotherapy model. And that's what we felt we hit a wall with, especially if we're really thinking about our model. And if that model based on encountering people as Christ begs that question, can we do more? And that's how we came up with this new modality of mentorship. Now, I have a question, um, which we could, we, it doesn't even have to end up being in the podcast or the show. <laughs> no, we're here. It'll end um, <laughs> but I, I, I had two questions, like how many people then can you take on per, like, for you, like how many people are you? Can what's you human? Take on? What's yeah. humanly realistic? What's realistic? And then, um, like, what happens, like, when somebody you realize, like, okay, this person, like, if it, if this were me and I was mentoring someone, but I realize, like, okay, there's a there's a mental illness, like, there's talk therapy that, because I remember you said a year ago, like, what I do is not hard, which I think. I was great that you said that because you're a doctor. Like, like I know some people who would be super offended. Like, how dare you say that? I had to go get a master's and get licensed. Right, through, right. Right. I know people who would be very offended. Like, how dare you say what we do is not hard. But you're like, I'm listening. I'm listening to people. But at some point, if people do need um, more than just talk therapy, like if they need EMDR, if they need medication, like what happens at that point? So I had two questions there. So number one, yeah. like how many people can you take on? And number two, um, like what happens when you realize like, oh, they need more than just for someone to listen. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, that's a great question. So we, we see generally 20 to 30 people a week. Uh, and we'll, we'll go on a monthly frame. So what that means is we'll sign people up for a month. And so at any given time, and we, we have, we have a, a Monday through Friday response. So we don't respond on Saturday or Sunday. So you can send us messages and care, we're carrying on the dialogue, but we do make space for a break before we give the next responses. So on Monday, we're following up with responses to whatever came in over the weekend. But for each, so we generally have 20 to 30 people that we're seeing at any given time. Uh, and and that'll be the range. 30 is already, it's kind of pushing it. It's kind of a max, um, but it, it's really individual. And the more that you practice, the more that you're trained, the more that you have supervision. We have a lot of ongoing supervision. Our whole team, myself included, are, are still involved in ongoing peer supervision and in training um, in terms of the limitations and when you need more than talk therapy, we, we talk about that in our certification. So it's a great question. There are certain things that need to happen in real time, even with talk therapy. Well, EMDR wouldn't necessarily consider just talk therapy that has to happen in real time. Also IFS therapy, which is a newer model. Um, it has certain components that are, that require being in real time with somebody. And so we would make a referral if we think that you now we're, we're working through trauma in mentorship and, and we're doing a lot of great work in, in, in trauma work and mentorship. And ultimately, relationship is the core component of what makes something effective. Like, I, I think EMDR is legitimate. I'm not against EMDR, but there there's a lot of good data that shows that shows the relationship you're forming within that EMDR process is also part of the effective reason why EMDR is working. And then uh, with IFS, there's something called unburdening where that's a process that happens in real time. And so it's, it's, that would be something we'd make a referral and we'd say, Hey, listen, like, you know, we've kind of hit a limit to what can happen in this outside of real time recorded methodology. I think you could use EMDR IFS or medication, you know, definitely like we're working with the whole scope. So we're looking at the body and there are limitations in which the body needs more intervention. We're looking at the spirit and there's interventions that are necessary, like confession or, you know, going back to mass or whatever. So we're going to make recommendations that fit the bill for wherever a person is, whether it's something in the middle with that psychological area where there's something a little bit more from real time that's necessary or medication or something more spiritual that's that's what we're helping them and we're going to accompany them to go to find those people to go through that process to still be there in their corner as they're going through sometimes very scary experiences jackie and i have been doing youth ministry in one way shape or form since we got out of it you know being core members 
making a fool of myself in skits. I was a campus minister at a high school for eight years, and I loved it. And so much of it was relationship. Like, I don't necessarily miss the grind of teaching. Um, I miss the classroom, but I miss, like, the relationships. As you said, like, the accompaniment, the being with. Like, this is what Jesus did. He was with people and sharing stories and sharing life. And this is where the relationships happen, the, the talking about the burdens I'm carrying, that's where it happens. I've heard, Jackie and I, we've heard so many confessions over the years. It's like, I can't absolve you, but like, <laughs> right. you know, good on you for like getting yes. it out. Go, go talk to that priest over there now. But I mean, it's just, it's so beautiful now as you're trying to think like the box we've been operating in, which we're here for a reason. We need to think of a new box. Like we need to, and that's going to look weird and it's going to look right. different and people you know, I'm going to question it. And again, good for you for seeing the need instead of saying, man, someone should do something. Um, it's like, no, no, like very much it feels like, and I'm looking across at a diff- a couple of different ministries too, at many ministries who it's almost like these teachings of John Paul II are finally, they've been absorbed like by us as a generation and been wrestled with. And like, how do I apply this in my field of, of psychotherapy or nutrition or like just health in general, it feels like it's stuff is finally kind of breaking through to the surface. It's it's kind of beautiful to see with those that the the eyes of faith like. Well, they're they're saying that healing is and it's the integration of the whole person. Mm. We're not just a mind. We're not just a soul. Like so, you know, people are like, oh, pray it away, and it's like, well, there we are spiritual, but we also do have a mind, and like, and and we have a body. It's like just. Whenever people just say, do one thing to heal something, I'm like, it's got to be the whole person. Well, even, even bodily health, how this whole um, rise of like our diet as like right. a God, like just eat the right things and, and worship your diet. I'm like, it's not phrased that way, but essentially like that becomes the most important thing. It's like, well, almost like they're promised they'll live forever. Versus, yeah. Like I, I know some people. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is, this is the thing. It's like, there's, there's this deep disintegration and dualism between the body and spirit and and it can go either way with the error it's more Mm. spiritual or it's more bodily and you know i feel very convicted by when george weigel wrote about the theology of the body and he said this is a ticking time bomb ready to go off and then you look around and it's like i feel like the fuse went out like where's the time bomb when did Mm. the bomb go off you know and i've been really wrestling with that because it's like john paul ii is god's gift to our world like no question and what what he did and what he wrote and what he brought to the world and to the church is 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 so important it's it's probably the most important thing that we'll we'll ever touch in our life and and in terms of like philosophy and theology and you know obviously not like the eucharist but (laughs) Right, right, right in terms of what we can read right and so so the thing is it's like where did it go And then, and then I started to think about this and I was thinking like, it's not a time bomb. It's a genetic mutation. (laughs) And, and what happens with the genetic mutation is it takes time to develop and then to show up in the next generation. And then, and that's where it's like, all right, so how can this change me and how can that change what I do? And now the fruit of my work and how that can little by little, slowly by uh, slowly start to seep in, into the common, you know, understanding now people don't even. So it kills me. Like, so how many people don't even know who John Paul II is of the younger generations? And that's like, are you serious? Like, how could you even be Catholic and not know who John Paul II is? But like, that's mind blowing. But it doesn't, they don't need to. Right. As long as that teaching and that truth and that understanding of the person does start to take root in this deeper way. And so bringing together this disintegration of dualism which is what the theology of the body is all about and bringing our bodies back into the conversation about being human and then understanding how psychology is in the middle. And then we can now have a psychology that's totally informed by our faith. That's what everything that I'm doing is all about. So do you, do you pray like, I'm sure as a psychologist, like you're kind of taught, like you separate your faith from, I mean, maybe not at the school you went to, but like, well, you, so you have a podcast called being human and yeah. it's it's very good. Like you get into some of these topics of like yeah, praying with a client, praying with a client. Like you're you're kind of told to bracket your faith and the faith of the client as something over here. So if anyone is hungry for podcasts, I'd say you have a great one being human that you and your team runs. 
Um, but essentially, like, y- y- you kind of feel it out and, and discern, like, if you well, can pray so with the client. You know, going back to something you said earlier, too, like, when I said that what I do is not hard, you know, the thing that's the, the most difficult thing about what I do is self is developing self-awareness. And, and it's like, I mean, there's technique and there's things to learn and there's things that are part of it. But the, the thing that messes most therapists up is their lack of self-awareness. And so when you come into the dynamic with your own needs and then you're looking for your own needs to get met mm. in that therapeutic dynamic, you hurt your client because a client comes to you expecting that they are the focus of your work, not mm. the therapist's own un- un- unknown subconscious need. So a lot of therapists are, are sort of like working out of a place of needing to be a Catholic therapist and ne- needing to be Catholic and needing to give what, what, what a person needs and a need, a person needs to pray or a person needs to go to confession or a person needs whatever, or the session needs to be in prayer. If this session doesn't start with prayer, it's not going to be a good session. Well, okay. But what if that person's abusive father always started the day with prayer before a day of abusing that person? Like there might be, And that's just an extreme example. And there's like a whole world of a spectrum of other examples of why maybe for the sake of this person, prayer is not good for them right now. Now, I internally am praying all the time before a session, during a session, after a session. We pray as a team when we're talking about cases before, during and after. And I'm, I'm constantly asking for insight and clarity and being able to, and and then if I'm if I need to find more self awareness about how I might be flubbing up the therapeutic process, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna pray for clarity in that matter. But it's not always the right thing to do to pray with a client, and so that that needs to be really carefully evaluated. I love what you said about the self awareness piece because I saw it too in teaching and campus ministry, like how much of this is me needing affirmation or me trying to get whatever versus genuinely trying to serve the young person in front of me and how exactly. that, that that's something we have to learn through trial and error and searching our heart and taking that to prayer and quiet and making sure we're in it for the right reasons, which is, there's is, a discernment process between two simple ideas of, of alignment and support and then challenge on the other side. And you have to develop enough of a rapport And then have a sense that the rapport we've built can hold the challenge that I now need to offer. And all of that needs to happen without reference to self. Because you might be overstating the rapport that you've built because you need to feel like you have good rapport. And you might be understating it. And you don't want to challenge. Maybe you don't want to challenge the other person because you're afraid of their pushback or how they're going to feel about you. And you don't want to deal with that. So you're like, wow, we haven't really built enough rapport yet for that. Like, no, nah, I think you have. You've been seeing this person for six months. I think it's time to bring up X, Y, Z or to name some discomfort in the room when you're working with this person and they're lashing out at you with their narcissistic attack. And you can actually tell them how that makes you feel as, an, as a human being on the other side of that. And that could be a therapeutic experience, but it might get messy before it gets better. You have to deal with that. So, yeah, there's a lot of that self-awareness to be able to even discern between those two poles of how to actually engage with people. Could you describe when it when it comes to like the certification, like how long it takes? Just tell us a little bit about the the actual certification, like what kind of classes do people take? And um, yeah, I just would like you to explain that. Sure. It could be done the fastest. It could be done as a year. Uh, we're just launching it now in October. So I don't know how the fastest uh, people will get through it. Um, but we'll find out. And uh, the, it could take up to two or three years. Um, there are 12 courses total. And then depending on the track, if it's the professional mentor track, we also give mentorship to all of our students. And so we're actually getting very involved in our certification students' lives. And we want to know that if we certify somebody and give them our stamp of approval, we really know that they've integrated this material and worked through their own stuff. And they're actually able to provide good supervision or good, good support towards other people. So we give them also then supervision. So the mentor relationship develops into a supervision relationship. They start seeing clients while part of the program, and then we'll, we'll sort of see how they're working with others. 
And then there's also a capstone part of it where they develop kind of essentially a business plan or a ministry plan. The idea is how are they going to take this model out into the world? And that's what I'm really actually most interested in is I don't want this to just be another school program. I just give you the degree and then you're, you know, gone. It's like the only reason we're doing this is because the model needs to be disseminated. So how are, how are people individually going to make this a part of their life moving forward? And so the whole thing, like I said, could be one to three years, um, 12 courses. There's four quarters. Each quarter has three courses. And we have one course each of anthropology, psychology, and spirituality in each quarter. So that, so that at, e at each level, as you're going up these four quarters of these four levels, you're, it, the focus changes. So like quarter one is all about the individual person. So we're looking at the person philosophically through the lens of John Paul II, his philosophy of the human person. And then spiritually, we're looking at sort of how the person is made to grow in relationship with God. And then psychologically, what does the science tell us about individual development, individual capacity, brain differences between men and women, sort of looking at the individual person? That's quarter one. Then we, we deepen that out into relationships. So people in relationship with each other. And then quarter three is an intimacy of relationships. So we start moving towards marriage and understanding uh, of, of romantic relationship and then deepening of an intimacy with God as well. And then the fourth quarter is all about transformation. And so how people are formed in the family, how we can actually approach people therapeutically and accompaniment to help them transform. And then ultimately in spiritual direction. So we're actually training spiritual direction as well as it's totally tied in with our model. Wow. And that, that, that's, again, such a beautiful, literally, integration of who we are instead of taking care of yourself in these, like, kind of bracketed places that are literally disintegrated all over the place. Exactly. Exactly. The secular world tells us that we have to separate out our spiritual life from our psychological life. It's like anybody who read any church fathers, anybody who read any church writings before 100 years ago, is going to see that these things are deeply tied in together. Like what spiritual director from any of the last 2000 years in any of their writings doesn't talk about the emotional life of their directees, you know, but then all of a sudden psychology comes onto the, the, the scene and it's like, well, you keep that separate, keep that out. And then all these Catholic therapists are like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll keep that out. This is not spiritual direction. This is, we're separating psychology. Like, well, wait a minute. Why? If, if, if we're growing in our emotional life and, and, and progressing and flourishing, shouldn't we be growing closer to God? I mean, can you imagine any scenario in which you're flourishing emotionally, but you're actually moving further away from God? I would say that that's not true flourishing emotionally. And can you imagine a, a, a situation in which you're growing closer to God, but you're not emotionally flourishing? That doesn't make any sense. Right. So this is a reclaim, we're reclaiming the truth of the human person. And we're going to open up opportunities for people to learn that and then also practice that and be able to do so fruitfully. I have a bonus question. Um, <laughs> before we wrap I up, love before we wrap up, I have a bonus question. Maybe this should go to the only, like only people who are Patreons or something are Patreons. <laughs> But I'll phrase that again just in case. We, we got to pay okay. extra for this one, folks. Here it comes. <laughs> yeah, let me ask this again. Okay. So I have a bonus question. And the question is for, you know, when I think of certain um, like personality disorders, because I feel like I've met quite a few like narcissistic personality disorders, like histrionic, you know, like people who are like very manipulative, like how much of that is... I, I know obviously there's a wound there and there's a there's a mental something happens in, in that, but like how much of that is like spiritual attack or how much, and then, cause I work also with people who do like deliverance ministry. So what would you say as a therapist? Like, I know that, yeah, there's a not, there's not a nice clean break between like the psychology and the spiritual as we're like, talking about right. right here. Is there a time that you're like, I think we might need an exorcist exorcist for this. Like, are there, are there times that you kind of notice like there is a, like a demonic, like, Oh yeah. As I've a, got three, I've got three exorcists on speed dial. Really? Okay. And then what, so what, how do you discern that as a, like, what would a normal therapist do who does not have this sense at all, who has no clue about the spiritual life? Like what would a normal therapist do versus you that you have three exorcists on call? 
Well, they would, they would, first of all, they would, they would start medication. So like a lot of the things that show up where we know we're going to, we're going to do a console or kind of figure out there's a, there's a lot of interplay. So a lot of times some of the, some of the demonic stuff looks like what would be seen as schizophrenia or, or those kind of really deep personality disorders that are very pervasive and, and sticky and can't, can't budge. Um, or just like reality testing type things. People have breaks, like such severe anxiety that, you know, they start breaking from reality, you know, and then it's like the OCD plus, you know, or you're, you're getting the extra. And so then it's like, oh, well, now we, we clearly need medication. Now, sometimes and many times do need medication. So I'm not saying it's an either or. But in terms of your question, that's where my radar goes up. And I'm like, well, let me start asking some other questions. When I first started and I was doing my post-grad, I was, I was consulting with a, a world-renowned psychiatrist who is on a panel for Vatican uh, demonology and, and trains exorcists. And I had a patient who came into my office in Manhattan and she was totally disheveled. Now, I did two years prior to this down in Washington, D.C., at a psychiatric hospital. So I was at the Psychiatric Institute of Washington. I was dealing all day with adult and adolescent uh, severe mental illness and a lot of schizophrenia. So this is like normal for me. And I now I come up to Manhattan and it's like not as severe, but it's like, so, you know, Manhattan is pretty crazy. So it wasn't always abnormal. But But this woman walks into my office one day and I was like, oh, I feel really comfortable in this situation. I feel like I'm back at PIW. She was really, you know, disheveled and, you know, there's things that are just off when, when people have schizophrenia, they don't care about the same kinds of things that everybody else cares about. And a lot of times. And so I'm thinking in that lens already, and she starts putting two and two together and she starts telling me what's going on. And I'm like, all right, this is like reality testing problems and, you know, all these other hygiene issues and like all these other things. So, um, so I'm talking to my supervisor and he says, well, you know, before you send her to a, a psychiatrist for medication, call this other guy and, and talk to him first. And he's a psychiatrist, but he also has some, uh, some understanding of the spiritual dimension of things. Because she had brought up a couple of little funny things. And I was like, well, that's interesting. So I call this guy. And... This is like gives me chills right now because one of the reality testing things that she did is I was sitting in the chair and I was holding my hand in a certain direction and uh, I was like holding my thumb inside my fingers and they're just like resting on the arm of my chair. And she said, yeah, see, see what you're doing right now. That's the devil that's making you do that. And I was like, OK, like I've been told worse. <laughs> you know, it's OK. But I brought this up to uh, to to this the psychiatrist. And his name is Rich Gallagher. And he, he was saying, uh, well, tell me more about this other thing that she said. So he told, she, she told me this other detail about somebody that was at the apartment and dropped off this token. And the token had this thing on it. And, and he goes, oh, yeah, we got to call the bishop. And I was like, why do we have to call the bishop? And he goes, because I know that demon. This is the third time this month he's come and, and his mention of him has come through my office. I'm like, what demon? He goes, the, the, the symbol on that, that token is very particular. And it, it has to do with this demon. And the demon is, is very real. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> so oh. tell me again about what I was doing with my hand. <laughs> so, so this demon was, like, was speaking to her and telling her all these things. And she was reacting in a lot of ways. Now, who's to say that she also didn't have you know, some severe mental illness? But but at the end, and she could, you know, she definitely got a full evaluation. But at the end of the day, that does happen. And so, and that's that's an extreme example of where those things show up. And then we ha we have to then go deeper or broader, I guess, to to understand that there's always a spiritual dimension. And even thinking about it, is it either or? Do I call an exorcist? I'll call I'll call priests. And you already mentioned unbound ministry. I'll, I'll call priests who are or at least trained in deliverance regularly to work with clients, not because we need a full out exorcism. And a lot of these exorcist priests will often say like, well, yeah, we'll, we'll do some deliverance prayer for a little while because there is a certain kind of stickiness that speaks to a, a, a covering over of the freedom of the human person. 
And sometimes that can be really deeply psychological. And sometimes that can be have, have its sort of ideology, it's, it's, it's genesis and something that's more, more spiritual. And we want to make sure we're covering all our bases. And then you learn over time. I asked him, I asked Rich Gallagher, you know, how do, how do you know? Like before I said the token, he goes, I already knew this, this was going to be a, a spiritual case. I said, well, how do you know? But even before I mentioned the token, he said, well, you listed like three different symptoms that could all be severe mental illness. But when they're in that combination, it's probably not, you know, and I was like a new student you know, I, I didn't know that I was an, a new a new psychologist. I hadn't yet had that experience or had developed that wisdom yet. He could nail it in, in a second. But but he, he could see that because it's like, oh, that combination was what was different. You don't find that in just a regular old run of the mill psychological illness. So it's it's it gets a little tricky to kind of navigate through that. But there's definitely people who do. So what you're saying is I need a few exorcists on speed dial. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I have a couple. I have a couple, but uh... a couple more. A couple, couple more, more would be helpful. I, I've got, oh, you know, I've got uh, cloistered nuns who pray for me regularly. You know, I said, you know, it's always great. That's a, that's a trick I learned as a friar. You know, Father Benedict, he would get cloistered nuns and uh, people with Down syndrome to pray for him, to promise him that they would be praying for him every day. He said, those are the people that are closest to God. And so he wanted their prayers every day. It's like, just get, gather, gather them up, you know, just like get, get selfish when it comes to this kind of thing. So yeah, the more grace, sisters. the better, the more grace, the more <laughs> prayer, the, the more intercession, the better. So I have, I have a bunch of sisters that I, that I entrust the whole work of Catholic psych into and our family and everything else for spiritual protection and guidance. That's awesome. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Dr. Bataro, this has been a great conversation where can people go to learn more about you and your work yeah so big picture like the overall general story of what we do is at catholicpsych.com that's a catholic psych institute um and and then this new venture of ours through mentorship and our certification program is at iddmentor.com that stands for integrated daily dialogic mentorship iddm so the website is iddmentor.com and people can find out more about the certification we have an open house they can sign up at iddm uh sorry iddmentor.com slash open house awesome great i have like 13 more questions but we're gonna table it there uh maybe we'll have, have to have part you, two yeah maybe have to do a part two uh have interview you for like the fifth time yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, he'll just be like the resident friend of the show. Yeah. You know, we'll friend have of... a couple friends of the show who will come on. And uh, when I have all these crazy questions, I'll just be like, so Dr. Bataro, this happened to me. What happened? <laughs> it's going to be called Dr. Greg. It's going to be like some, a new new segment that you guys do. Well, yeah. I'm yeah. Gonna have you guys Dr. On B, Greg. On soon, so we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll just keep trading shows back and forth. Sounds good. <laughs> we'll keep praying for you and your work. Dr. Bataro, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Whoa, what did you think of that episode, Bobby Angel? Tell us in the comments. Like, comment, subscribe, all the things now. Or don't. Do whatever you want. Whatever you want. You have free will. God bless.